part three of the Society for Fisheries Science lecture. We've been talking about how there's a curve in the road and that curve is climate change. And that's why instead of only looking at historical climate information, we have to look to the future. That's why we need climate projections. But when we look to the future, there are uncertainties. And the biggest uncertainty is us, us humans. To be specific, how quickly that curve is approaching and how steep it is depends on two things. It depends on human emissions of heat trapping gases that are driving climate change today, because according to natural factors, we should actually be getting cooler right now, not warmer. And second, the response of the climate system to this truly unprecedented experiment that we are conducting with the only home that we have. So how do we address these sources of uncertainty? We do so by using a range of what we call scenarios, climate scenarios. Climate scenarios capture the relationship between human population, our energy choices, our emissions, how much carbon dioxide we'll put into the atmosphere, and what temperature change will result. Why do we need scenarios? Because we can't predict human behavior. If we could predict human behavior, we climate scientists would all be out making millions of dollars on the stock market. We wouldn't be writing grants with the 5% return rate on them, would we? So we need these scenarios to look at the range of possible futures. And here's the really interesting thing that we're going to explore. And that is that these scenarios can actually dynamically alter the probability of an outcome. Because think about it this way. If no one ever told you that smoking was bad for your health, would you smoke? You probably would. If nobody ever told you that certain things were bad to do, you'd probably do them. So by looking at the negative consequences of climate change, it actually provides us with valuable information that we need to inform rational decision making that will tell us, hey, I don't want that future. So what can we do to avoid that future? The only reason that we know that we don't want that future is because we used scenarios to look at it. So for example, here are carbon emissions that are consistent with two different scenarios. Now these scenarios have different population associated with them. They have different kind of world views associated with them. They have different demographic properties and very different uh, sources of energy for sure. And the, the higher one depends more on fossil fuels through the end of the century, though with increasing efficiency and some renewables. Whereas the lower scenario transitions to renewables and reduces its carbon emissions significantly by the end of the century. So this is just an example of two of the different scenarios that we look at. Now, for these two lines, what difference does this make to us? Here's where the climate models come into it. We use these scenarios as input to climate models. And then the climate models can tell us things like what impact do these scenarios have on, for example, our average summer temperatures. Ready? Here we go. For the very near term, like, you know, the next decade, we're in 2020 now, so for the 2020s on average, there isn't a big difference between the outcome of the higher versus the lower scenario. We see about the same amount of change, about one to one and a half degree change. You might say, well, why is that? Well, look back at the scenarios. Are the scenarios very different by 2020? No, they're not very different. And you know what else? There's an inertia in the climate system. It takes a while to catch up to the carbon we're putting in the atmosphere. It's like your body takes a while to catch up to all the smoking you might be doing or all the fast food hamburgers you might be eating. I mean, you don't just eat, you know, 20 fast food hamburgers a day for two weeks and then have a, a heart attack. It takes years, even decades, for all of those hamburgers and inactivity and you know, poor behavior and diet choices, it takes years to decades for those to build up to the point where the crisis happens. It takes years to decades of smoking to build up to the point where you have the spots in your lungs, you have problems breathing, and you might even, heaven forbid, develop cancer. So there's a lag in our human systems in responding to the choices that we make. And in the same way, there's a lag in the climate system due to the exchange of heat primarily between the ocean and the atmosphere. There's a lag in the climate system to the emissions we put into the atmosphere. So near term, we don't expect a big difference between a higher versus a lower scenario. And this is important. Remember that for later when we're talking about how we pick our climate scenarios to work with. So near term, no big difference. 
But then by the time we get to the middle of the century, you can see a difference, can't you? I mean, I don't even have to label these two. You could guess immediately which was the higher and which was the lower scenario, right? And then by the time we get to the end of the century, the difference is stark. It is almost a factor of two different. But here's the thing. By the time we get there, we can't say, oh, oh, well, I don't want this one scenario. I want the other one. We can't say that because it's too late. It's like as if you're being loaded onto the ambulance when you've just had a heart attack and you're going to the hospital for quadruple bypass surgery and you say, oh, no, no, stop, stop. You don't have to take me to the hospital. I promise I will join a gym. I will eat healthily. Don't worry. I'll take a, I'll adopt all the lifestyle choices that you told me that my physician told me I should be doing, you know, 30 years ago. At that point, it's too late. So that's why it's so important to make these decisions earlier. It's almost like going to the doctor and the doctor telling you, look, your lifestyle choices matter. Here's the difference depending on the choices that you, in this case, all of us collectively make. Which future do you want? This is why scenarios are so important. Now, let me unpack the scenarios just a little bit. And if this gets too detailed, don't worry about it too much. If you want to kind of reflect over this and mull over it a little bit more, I would recommend that you read chapter four of the first volume of the National Climate Assessment, which I was the lead author on, because it explains this a little bit more. And sometimes it's easier to understand if you kind of read it and think about it a bit more. But I wanted to tell you about these scenarios very briefly because we work with them all the time. And often they're sort of like a black box. You know, you hear somebody say RCP and you don't even know what that is. Well, the RCP scenarios, that's what they're called, they, they, it stands for Representative Concentration Pathways. And nowadays they're actually called SSPs, which stands for Shared Socioeconomic Pathways, but they have the same radiative forcing associated with them as RCPs. Chapter four explains all of that if you want to get into it in more detail. Being scientists, what we do is we start with the quality that most matters in terms of human impact on the planet but which is least comprehensible to anybody outside of atmospheric science. And that is radiative forcing at the top of the troposphere, which is the lower level of the atmosphere in units of watts per meter squared. Why do we start with that measure? It's because all of the greenhouse gases that are building up are primarily building up in the lower atmosphere in the troposphere. They act like a blanket around the earth, trapping the earth's heat that would otherwise escape to the stratosphere, which is the next level up, and then eventually to space. And so that imbalance between the heat that's being trapped versus the heat that's escaping is the best measure of the impact that we as humans are having on our planet through the buildup of heat trapping gases in the atmosphere. But radiative forcing doesn't really relate to human choices and it doesn't really relate to what's going to happen in my watershed or my region or my state as, as a result of a changing climate. So what happens is with radiative forcing, we tend to work both backwards and forwards to turn this inf into information that's relevant to decision making. Like what? Well, if you work backwards, radiative forcing can be turned into emission pathways that are consistent with different decisions we could make regarding where we get our energy from. And if you work forwards, you can, using global climate models, you can turn these radiative forcing scenarios into estimates of how they would affect temperature, precipitation, heat waves, heavy rainfall, hurricanes, sea level rise, glaciers, and more. Things that affect us in the places where we live. Here are some figures that actually show how this translation happens. And it may be a bit more gory detail than you wanted, but I think it's helpful to actually look at them. So the scenarios are radiative forcing scenarios in units of watts per meter squared. And this actually explains where the numbers come from. Because a six means that it gets to six watts per meter squared by the end of the century. You can see the black line there, it's almost getting to six. The blue line, 8.5, means it gets to 8.5 by the end of the century. But these are translated, first of all, into carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere. So the colors here are the same, but you can see that radiative forcing means very different to carbon dioxide concentrations. In fact, the carbon dioxide concentration of the highest scenario is going up exponentially to keep the same level of radiative forcing. And then the CO2 concentration goes into the climate models, which do the translation work to translate it into global temperature. And you can see here the squiggly black line is our observed global temperature up until about 2016, 2017 there, I think. And then the colored lines, unfortunately, I made the plot on the right and I did not make the plot on the left. So the plot on the right has different colors because I think a higher scenario should be red and I think a lower scenario should be green. Just makes sense, right? So 
I changed the colors for communication purposes, but you can still see they're the same scenarios and you can see that there's the temperature change now, this is globally, and there's also a range of uncertainty around that to do with the second thing on our list. Remember the first thing on our list was human choices, the second thing on our list was how is the climate system going to respond to the choices that we make. So just to put all this together, and these are figures from the National Climate Assessment. On the left-hand side, you have the carbon emissions associated with four different scenarios. In the middle, invisible, you have the radiative forcing that started it all. And on the right-hand side, you have the global temperature change, which then drives the whole cascading set of impacts on you know, wildfire and heavy rainfall and heat waves and sea level rise and more. Which of these scenarios is most likely? I often get asked this question. People want to say, well, look at all these different colored lines. Just tell me which one's most likely. I bet it's the one right in the middle, isn't it? The reason we think that is because as physical scientists, we are used to the fact that most physical uncertainty follows a pretty normal distribution. In other words, the values in the middle have a greater chance of being accurate than the values out at the tails of the distribution. But here's the thing. Are these colored lines physical uncertainties? No, they are not. The different colors represent human uncertainties, specifically human choices. Do humans behave in a nice Gaussian way? Absolutely not. We can behave like a herd of lemmings sometimes. We can have bimodal distributions. We can have um, all kinds of very weirdly shaped distributions. I mean, who knows which of these is most likely. Maybe we'll be going up the red for a while as we currently are. We're just starting to actually bend off the red one a little bit. But then what if we hit a no shit moment when all of these catastrophes overwhelm us and we realize that yes, climate change is here and now. It's actually the third week in March and we're all getting coronavirus, so to speak. What if we hit a moment like that and we take a sudden dive? Well, we wouldn't follow any of these lines. We'd be following the red and then we take a sudden dive down to the blue or maybe the green if we could. In fact, the bottom line is this. Unless you are one of these two people, do not try to pick a most likely scenario. Who are these two people? On the left side, we have God. In the middle, we have Miss Cleo the psychic. Now, I had a personal encounter with Miss Cleo. I don't know if you remember her. This might date me a bit because she had all the ads on TV back in the days when we actually watched TV. But one day when we were first married, living in South Bend, Indiana, my husband was a professor at Notre Dame at the time, one day I opened our long distance phone bill. That was back in the days when we had long distance phone bills too. And it was almost $1,000. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, I do call home to Canada quite a bit, but not that much. So I looked at the phone bill and it turned out that 950 of that $1,000 was calls to Miss Cleo, which, if you're ever wondering, rack up to about $10 per minute. It turned out, long story short, and I'm not kidding, somebody had been climbing the telephone pole at the corner of our block with special spiked shoes. They had shaved off the covering on one of the wires, which just happened to be our phone line. They had tapped into the wire at two in the morning and they had been calling Miss Cleo from our phone. Now, I'm joking about Miss Cleo. Even if you are Miss Cleo, I don't think you'd be able to pick the right scenario, even for $10 a minute. And that is because scenarios are a little bit like Schrodinger's cat. Do you remember the, the mythical cat that the act of actually observing the cat in the box would determine whether the cat was dead or alive? Well, here's the thing. The act of observing the impacts of our scenarios actually determine whether we're going to follow those scenarios or not. So the probability is dynamically altered every single time we study the impacts of a higher versus a middle versus a lower scenario that actually affects how we think about it, affects the information we have to provide to people, and hopefully, fingers crossed, in a rational world, I recognize the irony of saying fingers crossed and logical, but hopefully in a rational world, the act of studying the negative impacts of a higher scenario would dynamically increase the probability of us doing what we could to meet a lower target. So you'll notice that these scenarios um, originally started back in 2005. That's when the RCP scenarios were designed. And of course, now it's 2020. So we can ask, well, how are we doing so far? And there's good news and there's bad news. So the good news is that global coal use is dropping like a rock. That is fantastic. So the carbon emissions associated with RCP 8.5 might no longer be realistic. But the bad news is the climate feedbacks in the system, which we'll talk about in the next part, 
which are the two pieces that go together in determining the overall radiative forcing, those appear to be speeding up a bit. So in the set, that sense, the radiative forcing associated with 8.5 is still viable even if our coal emissions are dropping. When we look around the world, we see other pieces of positive and negative news, like what? Well, 30 major cities, their emissions have already peaked. That's great news. That means they're starting to go down. But the ride hailing services that we all use are increasing our carbon emissions, Uber and Lyft. Now, Lyft has already said that they're planning to go to zero emission vehicles, which is pretty cool if they do that. Then we've got the fact that China's coal consumption and United States' coal consumption is in free fall. That's fantastic. But at least in China, you know what they're doing? They're selling their coal to poorer countries and they're building coal-fired power plants in those countries. And of course, it doesn't matter where it's burned in terms of its carbon emissions. It matters where it's burned in terms of its air pollution because air pollution is very short-lived in the atmosphere. So it mostly affects the regional area around where you burn the coal. But the carbon is very long-lived, so it doesn't matter where you burn it. It affects the atmosphere equally. We also know that the lockdowns associated with the coronavirus pandemic decreased global carbon emissions. In some places in China, they were down by 25%. Globally, in the month of April, they were down by 17%. But we also know this. As soon as the lockdowns passed, we see those carbon emissions ratcheting right back up again. Why? Because they weren't achieved through sustainable methods. Like what? Sustainable methods consist of increasing efficiency, if the U.S. increased its efficiency in its energy use, it could cut its carbon emissions 50%. Yeah, that's five zero percent It also consists of replacing dirty sources of energy with clean sources of energy that don't produce heat-trapping gases. And it also consists of drawing down carbon into the biosphere and the soil, places where we actually want carbon, taking it out of the atmosphere. Those are sustainable solutions. How did we cut carbon emissions during the coronavirus pandemic? through shutting down industry, throwing people out of work, taking kids out of school, stopping people from traveling, those are not sustainable, those are unsustainable methods. But the good news is this, if they had been sustainable, if the coronavirus carbon drops had been sustainable, we'd be halfway to our 2030 Paris Agreement goal in just a few months, which is amazing. So it shows that we really can make a difference when we act, but we have to do it the right way. So the way that I think of the scenarios is like this. I think of the higher scenarios as showing us what we can avoid by prompt action now. And I think of the lower scenarios as showing us as what we're going to have to adapt to no matter what, even if we try our hardest. Those are both very useful things to know. And that's one of the biggest reasons why we want at least two scenarios, if not more, when we're looking to characterize that future curve.